welcome all of the colleagues uh, i think some of them uh, uh, are going to join us a little bit late so let them join in uh, later on but we should start it because uh, we have to close this within 6 uh, pm mm, because it's uh, now you know the sunset are a little bit earlier than the earlier than the than the you know in april may so today our guest is knud booking uh knud is working with urge world urge world is a german civil society organization and very active uh against the fossil fuel investment especially uh human rights violation uh by the world bank uh, projects and also nowadays asian development bank adb and asian invest uh, infrastructure investment bank aiib uh Knud is the lead of uh, international uh, campaign against international financial institutes in urge world and uh, he has a long track of activism in germany and globally um, and also i i want to mention you uh, all that uh, Knud is one of the key person uh, who started the campaign in 2006 when the full body uh, coal mine project uh, was supposed to uh, invested by AI, ADB, Asian Development Bank. And Knud also uh, visits several universities to, uh, to share his experience with the students in different universities in Germany. So the floor is for Knud today. Uh, let's welcome Knud Hocking here. And uh, uh, the, in the earlier uh, course, uh, which which started in February 2021, Knud was also there. Uh, uh, Urge World is also a uh, co-organizer of this course. So um, I think you can get uh, more insights on World Bank and uh, a little bit EIIB or e, uh, European Development Bank. Uh, EDB uh, from Knud. Knud, mic is yours for next one hour. <laughs> Thank you very much, uh, dear friend Mehdi. Uh, and uh, yeah, hello and welcome to, to everybody here. Um, well, I, I have a, a slight correction to the introduction. I uh, uh, Urgewald came into the Fulbari campaign in 2008, but uh, what is true is that we were instrumental in uh, kicking the ADB out uh, um, of uh, of the finances. And fortunately, it still is, it's still a zombie, but it, it, uh, I, we still hope that it won't go forward. Um, first of all, uh, like uh, Mehdi uh, told you, um, there will be the World Bank Action Day, and I'm uh, putting um, the website uh, address uh, and... Uh, the timing uh, into uh, the chat. You can check this out. And uh, um, the actions uh, are globally uh, in every time zone. There should be something going on at noon on the 15th. But uh, in your country, as you're uh, mostly Muslim, uh, we uh, extended uh, this to, um, to the 14th so that uh, you can um, worship on on friday uh, and uh, well today is a friday so it's a bit strange uh, but it so it's uh, uh, in a way it's uh, the same day uh, like like our sunday in 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 europe but we just wanted to respect this and and so put uh, an additional day uh, to it also there will be a global uh, sign on letter uh, to the World Bank to uh, more or less saying that uh, uh, the owners, so the countries who are sh uh, owning shares of the World Bank should uh, reconsider and uh, exchange the whole uh, senior management of the bank because they are failing uh, to answer the climate threat. Um, I, I saw that Clean has just signed on to this letter, which is great. Um, but now uh, let me tell you a little bit about um, the World Bank, the European Investment Bank, and uh, the things around human rights. Uh, and um, but I won't 
take very very long because uh, I think uh, we should have a dialogue. It's it's much more vivid uh, if you don't hear just a, a long monologue, but uh, uh, just a, a short introduction, and then you can uh, ask questions, and I try my best to answer them. Um, yeah, uh, around. <coughs> sorry. Um, so just just some basic facts. Uh, the World Bank uh, was founded in 1944. Um, in at the end of the Second World War, and uh, the vision was to uh, avoid uh, the catastrophic economic uh, um, uh, things that happened after the First World War, but to reconstruct uh, uh, Europe and and other countries as soon as po as possible. Uh, it became operational in 1945, and uh, when the decolonization um, was going on in the 50s, 60s, and 70s, the bank switched his, uh, uh, the, the business model to development. And uh, one thing which is very important, I think, is that um, the World Bank, although they are constantly avoiding uh, this to be mentioned, is a part of the UN system. It's not uh, like UNICEF or, uh, um, uh, or UNDP or so, uh, an integral part of the United Nations, but it's uh, a part of the whole system. And so um, at least uh, we as NGOs say that um, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights uh, and also the uh, additional uh, treaties like uh, the, the, the Pact on, on Economic, uh, Cultural and Social Rights should be um, obeyed by the World Bank. But the Articles of Agreement, uh, so the statutes uh, um, which led to the foundation of the bank, uh, explicitly say that the bank is non-political, which means the bank has no role in, to interfere in politics. Well, when you see what they actually are doing uh, with uh, development policy operations, with technical assistance and all that stuff, then they are very, very political. But anyway, um, and so the Articles of Agreements are uh, the reason why uh, many um, countries who are member of the World Bank are uh, saying, well, don't mention human rights in any policy. Uh, this would be political. Um, so much for as basics for, for the World Bank. Um, the uh, European Investment Bank was founded in 1958, and um, it is an instrument of the European Union. It's the bank uh, of the European Union, and uh, as such, um, there are several additional means of uh, uh, filing complaints in comparison to the World Bank. You know, the World Bank has uh, is immune. Uh, in general, so everything they are doing, they are, can do without uh, being sued at any court. Um, and it, it still persists, although the um, uh, Supreme Court of the US limited this a little bit recently, but um, uh, it still is the case that any uh, uh, international multilateral organization is immune and has diplomatic immunity. So, um, but, and, and so they can't be sued, but there is the inspection panel uh, for the uh, public sector and the compliance advisor ombudsman for the private sector operations of the World Bank where you can file a complaint, um, but there's, they have no uh, uh, actual jurisdiction. They can just uh, uh, investigate and report. Um, the uh, EIB also has, um, of course, an accountability mechanism. But the interesting thing there is that uh, it, uh, the EU has uh, a European ombudsman. Uh, and this is somebody who uh, really has power and can um, interfere and can uh, uh, publicly shame uh, the EIB and tell uh, the European Union that things have to be changed. 
um, you may have heard about the European Court of Human Rights. That's also uh, an entity where people can file uh, human rights complaints, but it's not an institution of the European Union of the 27 member states. It's uh, an institution of the Council of Europe. The Council of Europe is much broader. Uh, Russia, for example, is member there, Turkey. Uh, and uh, so it's almost every state uh, of Europe uh, is member of the Council of Europe. And uh, so you see the human rights system uh, is a little bit uh, different. The, uh, the whole uh, human rights debate at the World Bank and other uh, uh, multilateral development bank uh, came uh, to fruition uh, uh, when they uh, revised their safeguards in um, in the early 2000s. That's when when uh, there was much more emphasis on human rights from the side of um, the uh, NGOs and uh, also, of course, of the affected communities. And uh, interestingly, also um, the United Nations uh, um, were taking a look into this. There was the special rapporteur, Philip Alston, who, um, uh, who authored a very damning report on what's going on at the World Bank, and he called the World Bank a human rights free zone. Um, and so um, there's still a lot of debate going on. But the World Bank um, is, is doing everything to avoid uh, the term human rights uh, in any of their policies. Um, and uh, um, they're doing this on, on purpose um, because they, um, they are struggling with many, many of their member states. As you uh, all know, there are lots of uh, uh, energy projects, energy programs going on with the World Bank in your region, in, uh, in India, in Africa, Latin America, almost everywhere. And um, one, one of the um, huge cases uh, that yeah, almost everybody knows about is um, um, the, the financing of the Namada uh, dams in, uh, in the in the 80s and 90s uh, uh, through the World Bank. And also one thing where I uh, worked on uh, is an energy project in uh, Western Cent and Central Africa called the um, Chad Cameroon Pipeline. Um, in, in Chad, had, uh, th there was the uh, development of uh, oil fields by uh, Exxon, Chevron, uh, 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 Petronas and, and, and some others, and uh, uh, they needed a pipeline from the oil fields to the shores of Cameroon. And um, in, in this project, there were huge human rights violations. First and foremost, um, all the money uh, went to the dictator, uh, uh, and, and he even got a, a bonus, uh, uh, a signature bonus from Exxon, several million, I guess, 10 or 20 million US dollars, which then uh, went almost directly into uh, uh, the expansion of the military um, to suppress uh, so-called rebels, uh, so meaning people who spoke up in, in the country. And uh, also um, in Cameroon, um, there was uh, a lot of violation of the rights of uh, indigenous people. There were these so-called pygmies uh, who were living in the forests and um, their lands was just taken away without uh, compensation or with uh, compensation that was afterwards taken away by, by officials through uh, bribery and, and, and other stuff. And so this all was, uh, in human rights terms, it, it was uh, a total mess. Um, I guess uh, you know from your own country a lot of uh, um, examples where uh, people had to suffer from um, energy projects and 
get no compensation, get uh, thrown out of their livelihoods, um, and uh, yeah, get 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 nothing at all. And so um, we as NGOs tried very very hard uh, to get a, a, a human rights a perspective into uh, the safeguard, so the environmental and social framework of the of the World Bank, and uh, uh, because we said there has to be a, a human rights due diligence done uh, in any project, uh, be it uh, an agricultural project or an energy project, a road project, whatever, um, and not uh, um, something uh, which is well. Say is is the other human rights of uh, uh, Mr. X or Mrs. Uh, uh, Z uh, uh, in 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 violation? But it's it's a, a general survey of the country where uh, would be uh, uh, human rights problems that have have to be uh, um, mitigated or avoided uh, through the design of the project. So that you know, when when there are consultations, that uh, there have to be provisions that there's no military presence, so that people can speak up freely and things like these. Um, but uh, big shareholders like China, like India, like Russia, Saudi Arabia, uh, were fighting tooth and nails, uh, uh, um, and. Uh, uh, we're saying this is all political. This is uh, an interference in our sov sovereignty when you uh, uh, talk about human rights uh, in our country. And so uh, in the end, there was just one sentence uh, in the uh, preamble saying that uh, fulfilling human rights was an aspiration of the World Bank, which uh, yeah, in itself is... is at least it, it, the, the word human rights is there for, uh, at one uh, instance, but it's uh, definitely not enough. And uh, we will be facing uh, similar problems uh, in the upcoming review of the Asian Development Bank's uh, safeguard system, where China also uh, uh, has something to say. And uh, uh, China um, um, is... is Def definitely is not uh, um, the evil monster that somebody or so some people want to picture it because uh, uh, all countries, all governments uh, uh, are not without blame. Uh, but China is uh, one of the biggest economies now and they have a huge influence, especially in Asia. Um, and uh, um, what they are trying to do is they try to uh, in a way to redefine uh, human rights language. So um, when uh, when the, the old fashioned human rights uh, 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 um, terms are are taken, they try to re um, yeah reinvent them, reshape them so that uh, it's more to their idea what human rights mean. And uh, um, we. We, together with uh, Amnesty International Hong Kong, tried to uh, debunk this, to decode what uh, um, what they are meaning. And uh, there's a website that maybe you uh, would love to to check out, where you can see uh, uh, the dialogues about uh, uh, what what it means, what what China says, and what what others are saying. And I don't know, maybe um, um, a similar terminology on human rights may also be used by other Asian countries. Um, yeah, I leave it like this because I've talked to over more than 10 minutes now and uh, um, I'm happy to answer any questions that I can possibly answer. Any questions? No? I think I think Knud, you can you can tell about some case stories, some stories, uh, and and about the management and their tendencies and political, especially the report, uh, recent report, uh, business, doing business. 
yeah. yeah of course i can i can i can do this this also um well you know um the, we we take the world bank here as an example but uh world bank stands for the whole uh, uh system of multilateral development banks because they're all shaped in the same format uh um uh, they all uh follow the same blueprint of uh operations of uh, of of policies and of uh, decision making processes um the the world bank is um in in the articles of agreement it says that the world bank should uh first and foremost uh finance projects so the project means one power station uh one train line uh one hospital or so uh, but over time uh, this shifted dramatically uh, and nowadays most of the operations are done uh, through programmatic lending meaning that um, either the countries are getting uh, just budget support as a just a chunk of money that they are getting or um, they're getting programmatic loans meaning for example under the uh, the headline of uh, developing the small and medium enterprises in the chittagong area for example um, and then there are lots of sub projects uh, which uh, could uh, could come to fruition and uh, um, one um, one instrument uh, that they are taking uh, when um, they are giving a country uh, development policy loans uh, is uh, that uh, just before the whole uh, um, negotiation end and before the this uh, loan agreement is signed there have to be prior actions and uh, uh, so in, in in easy terms you only get the money uh, that we can give you for this or that program if you do a b c and um, when you look at these prior actions and uh, uh, colleagues have written several reports on on this um, there might be uh, something like uh, uh, decrease the number of civil servants to um, uh, to save some money or um, uh, um, uh, cut uh, uh, subsidies for uh, uh, yeah uh, for burning materials so like like uh, uh, coal kerosene or whatever uh, energy so uh, energy uh, um, subsidies which mostly then uh, are cutting subsidies for the poor so that uh, um, people who actually provide uh, uh, energy sources can can earn more money um, and um, yeah things like these are cutbacks in social uh, spending and things like these um, in older times these uh, 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 conditions were called conditionalities and uh, also it was a, a, a huge fight of uh, NGOs to to get rid of this and so uh, the world bank officially got rid of uh, conditionalities but reinvented them through the back door uh, and uh, as you can imagine if if a country is desperate for money and um, um the the one uh, institution that can give you the money is asking you or is yeah, commanding you more or less uh, to cut back social spending, to uh, privatize hospitals, to uh, um, to pay less uh, money for teachers and things like these, then this is a a very political thing, and b it has direct uh, influence on uh, the development of human rights in in that country. Um, and. Uh, one very shady uh, um, thing that the World Bank had introduced in the early 2000s was the so-called doing business report. Uh, and uh, this caused a scandal just recently because the doing business report uh, was ranking countries uh, how friendly they are towards external 
uh, investors. And uh, you can imagine that uh, a country where you have no ecological standards, where the labor uh, rights are very, very low, where the taxes are very, very low, is a nice place to invest. And so um, the, the doing business ranking really came up with the list of countries where, uh, um, yeah, um, when, whenever uh, you, uh, um, a government tried to introduce a new uh, ecological uh, laws or, uh, uh, or higher wages or so, they dropped down the ranking. And um, that, of course, uh, caused an uproar uh, in, in civil society. And we know uh, uh, from, from um, reports from the ground that, for example, in Zambia, uh, there was a special task force in the finance ministry checking out the new report and instantly rewriting uh, the law so that uh, the next year they would climb up the letter in um, letter in in, uh, in the ranking because uh, they thought that this ranking would be uh, very instrumental to acquire uh, external investments and uh, yeah in uh, uh, in in the uh, four or five years ago, um, the, the World Bank was longing for a capital increase. And you had, uh, and in the same year, China uh, was dropping uh, in this ranking. But uh, of course, because China is very influential and China is the main uh, uh, recipient of loans from the World Bank, um, they didn't want to alienate uh, this powerful country. And uh, so uh, they uh, uh, fingered uh, in, in their methodology uh, so that uh, China didn't uh, uh, drop down uh, in the ranking just to please China. Uh, in other instances, uh, the, the guy who had invented and, and uh, administrated this whole ranking uh, intentionally uh, uh, um, changed the methodology in a way that countries which he didn't like uh, um, dropped in the ranking. So the whole uh, thing was messed up and uh, Paul Roma, uh, a very prestigious uh, uh, economist who uh, had become the um, chief economist of the World Bank, made the, uh, made the fact that the, the methodology was flawed. He made it public and uh, was also pressed to resign, but then there was an uh, um, investigation and uh, this investigation clearly showed that there had been uh, uh, abuse of, of the method methodology and that uh, senior management of the bank was really acting politically uh, to, um, uh, to please those countries. So this also was uh, something you know, with the whole uh, method of, of uh, management of the bank is geared towards um, attracting foreign investment in, in countries and not so much uh, to uh, help the help countries to overcome uh, underdevelopment, uh, what, what they in general call underdevelopment. Well, currently there's a discussion whether the term development uh, is the right term, uh, it, uh, even it shouldn't be a global justice because uh, uh, it doesn't make sense uh, uh, to, to get every country uh, to a so-called development stage of the United States, for example, because then uh, we will have exploited our planet in, within two years. Uh, um, but it it's, has to be with global justice so that everybody has a has a good livelihood uh, in his own or her own uh, cultural background, and not so much that everybody has uh, has a Ferrari and uh, 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 a big villa. Um, yeah, that 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 was one one example how the World Bank is uh, acting politically, and uh, uh, in in contrast to uh, what they are saying that human rights uh, are are 
political and they couldn't act on them. So uh, this kind of contradiction is, is typical not only to the World Bank. It's, it's, it's uh, really typical for, for many uh, um, development banks. And uh, um, we as NGOs are trying to, to fight uh, to get at least the, uh, the contents of human rights uh, into uh, uh, the standards uh, and, and the projects of the, uh, of the multilateral development banks, uh, even uh, if they don't tell this human rights, because uh, um, it is, at least I think that it, it's uh, better to have uh, the material contents of a human rights standard uh, within the operations, uh, uh, and it's not, uh, it, it doesn't, uh, I, I don't care whether uh, the headline is right, I care about uh, the, the practical outcome of, of this. Thank you, Knud. Uh, I, I can see one question from Riksona Parvin. Uh, please elaborate a little about the China, uh, you know, what is the redefinition of their uh, human rights one thing and second i have another question that please uh, let us know a little bit about uh, the structural adjustment program and the role of world bank uh, in market economy and like that you know oh. <laughs> um yeah well maybe first of uh, uh, about china trying to redefine um you, you definitely should have a look at, at the, the, this World Bank, what China says, .org. It's, uh, because I haven't been uh, um, involved in this, uh, in the development. My, my colleague, Nora Zosmikat, who, is, uh, uh, um, who has developed this, uh, um, this website and, and the, the, those uh, papers together with Amnesty, is much more knowledgeable about uh, these things. But uh, um, I, I only can say that uh um they uh, in china they try to uh, uh, to come into uh, many uh, un uh, entities like the uh, fao and uh, world health organization and you name it and try to um uh, to shift uh, the whole discussions from individual uh, rights that you have to more uh, collective things. So saying, for example, that uh, um, um, in, so in, in very uh, um, uh, simple terms that I'm not speaking, the thing is more complicated than what I'm saying now, but uh, that, for example, um, it's not so important to have the right to speak up as long as you have uh, food and shelter and uh, um, a good um, health system. Whereas um, the Western style is more the contrary and is also not okay, uh, saying that uh, it's, it's uh, um, your political rights to speak up, to have a demonstration, to, be, uh, um, to have the freedom of opinion, to freedom of speech, freedom of press, so that's important. Um, but it's not so important whether you have enough food and uh, whether you have a, a roof above your head and uh, and and a good uh, social security. So there are clashes uh, between the two systems, and uh, um, the 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 uh, UN system uh, with the introduction of economic, uh, cultural, and social rights. Uh, make this a holistic approach so that uh, uh, um, human rights mean you have the political right to speak up, to assemble, to form unions, uh, and so on and so forth, um, to, uh, uh, to vote freely and so on. But you also have the right uh, uh, to housing, the right to food, the right to, to uh, health and social security. And so this is the the whole package has to be uh, uh, seen and not just uh, uh, bits and pieces of the packages. And the, the political debate uh, now is uh, which uh, uh, will be the, the, the focus of, of it. And uh, yeah, China tries uh, 
to shift the discussion in a way that uh, uh, it's going away from uh, uh, political rights and only looks at uh, um, e economic and, and social rights, not so much the cultural rights, because uh, when you think about uh, Xinjiang and the, how they are treating the Uyghur minority there, then there's definitely uh, no respect for cultural rights in, in China. I hope that helped a little bit. And uh, well, on, 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 uh, on, on the uh, structure adjustment, um, as Mehidi already said, it, uh, it's uh, the so-called old Washington consensus. Um, the World Bank, uh, was kind of spearheading uh, neoliberal approaches uh, in the 80s and 90s. Uh, and also, yeah, there still are, but, but not so explicit as they, as they did. So they, they really uh, tried uh, to make every aspect of economy, every aspect of life uh, uh, ready for a market. And, uh, um, so um, their prescription was um, really privatize everything that you can privatize and uh, the, the state should be uh, kept out, out, of, uh, out of all these things and um, that uh, uh, money would trickle down from, uh, from investments, from foreigners, uh, uh, into the coffers of uh, uh, of the country, and that would then help uh, uh, to raise social security and 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 yeah, uh, um, countries were really selling out uh, all their all their properties, and um, yeah, uh, and and now uh, some countries are really. Uh, um, dependent on constant injections of uh, foreign money from multilateral development banks. Uh, because uh, also um, uh, one thing that from my uh, perspective, uh, uh, the World Bank and others should have done, but that was not in the interest of course of the uh, Northern countries was to develop um, uh, a self-sustaining uh, um, industry in, in countries of the global south. So, uh, for example, uh, copper is a, um, a huge export pro product of Zambia, but it's just mined there. And then uh, the raw material is being exported instead of uh, having uh, facilities in, in country where uh, you can smelt copper, you can uh, uh, produce uh, um, copper plates uh, and, and other things just being exported. Uh, similar things is, is, well, Nigeria, for example, is, is, uh, is a tragic example. You know, you have uh, in the Niger Delta, you have uh, lots of oil wells, you have gas wells. Uh, but just last year, uh, um, the first uh, refinery for oil and gas was opened up in, in Nigeria. Now that the, the time of fossil fuels should be over, uh, they are starting uh, to refine. But when I was in, in, uh, uh, in Nigeria in 2004, uh, people in Nigeria had to, to buy uh, the kerosene for, uh, for their uh, ovens, uh, which was imported from abroad and they had to, to uh, pay high prices for this. So the, the whole system is uh, uh, shaped in a way that uh, uh, um, the, the countries of the global south are at either sweatshops or, uh, or raw uh, uh, material producers, but uh, all the value generation uh, then is done in the countries of the north. And that is, uh, supported by the actions of the World Bank and other uh, multilateral development banks. Yeah, I think, I think um, the colleagues, you understood a little bit 
you know because it's it's not so easy thing uh, there are linkages between you know bankruptcy linkages between balance of payment in in importing and exporting and then the the foreign currency reserve in the countries and then to make it uh, so that the countries can pay back the loans from uh, taken from the uh, multilateral development banks like uh, world bank uh, adb or aiib but i want a little bit you know if you focus a very little knud that earlier this china um, india russia and uh, and saudi arabia they are fighting with their uh, teeth and nails uh, together to get uh, you know get more shares or or more control over world bank but we experienced that uh, the scenario has been changed a little in last uh, maybe one decade or more uh, can you a little bit focus on that things um so so you mean the the shift of uh, uh, of influence in 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 the mdbs yeah well yeah. Uh, um um the world bank uh, traditionally was was uh, uh, governed by uh, the us japan and the europeans uh, you still see this because of 25 uh, um executive directors on the, on the board uh, you only have uh, three from sub saharan africa but you have uh, one from uh, um the us one from japan one from uk uh, one from germany one from france uh, then you have country group one one that is representing a country group who is from 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 austria or belgium one from from italy one from switzerland so you have uh, yeah almost at least a third uh, of all executive directors are still uh, 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 from from the rich countries and uh, they uh, in total hold uh, the vast majority of shares because it's not uh, uh, like in the un general assembly one uh, country one vote but it's more like uh, uh, um, within the security council uh, uh, where uh, uh, some countries have a veto power and others don't and uh, so it because it, it's really like the numbers of shares uh, the, the us alone has uh, uh, six around about 16 percent of the shares and uh, um, all um, basic uh, decisions have to be made by an 85 percent majority so whenever the us says no nothing is happening and um, this kind of uh, uh, veto power uh, had been executed um, a lot of times uh, and uh, this led to a huge frustration uh, with uh, especially with china because uh, um, from time to time uh, the voting shares and and uh, and, and the um, the shares as such uh, are uh, uh, are recalculated due to the economic power of the uh, specific country and uh, as you know, China has risen uh, extremely high and now is, is about to become the, the most powerful economy of the world. And, but they still are uh, ranking quite low, um, comparably low to, uh, uh, if you compare it to uh, the US and the US uh, Congress always blocked uh, uh, more voting shares, uh, uh, a new uh, distribution so that uh, China could get uh, more more say in the bank, and uh, well, that led uh, <clears throat> as one one of the reasons, not the only reason, but one of the reasons uh, this led to uh, the establishment of the um, uh, Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank, which is now uh, uh, clearly uh, uh, a Chinese-led bank, and uh, um, the the other. Uh, uh, countries uh, uh, like like India, South Africa, uh, um, Russia, um, and, and also Brazil. You know they they uh, this there's a so-called BRICS bank. So Brazilian, Russian, 
uh, Indian, China, and South Africa Bank, the so-called New Development Bank. Um, they also tried to uh, to counter the World Bank, but that didn't succeed so so well because um, on the capital markets uh, they didn't have the backing of the uh, traditional northern countries. Um, and but but there, there's uh, the whole power uh, um, relations within uh, the multilateral system is is shifting, is changing. And um, the term of, of uh, Donald Trump in, uh, in the US did a lot to help China to, uh, uh, to gain more power because uh, the US became, uh, yeah, well, uh, um, more or less a failed state to, uh, 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 through this time. Um, and um, yeah, now you, you have the, you have a, a a problem, a political problem. On the on the one hand, it is just and fair that countries who have uh, um, have become uh, um, economically stronger should have a say. On the other hand, if you just see through the lens of human rights, uh, you definitely have a problem with this because uh, China, although as I said. It's not the villain of the world, but it definitely is an authoritarian state. Russia is, well, uh, um, the elections have been have been a little bit flawed, I would say. And uh, um, and so uh, um, and other countries also have their have their political problems. So people who are uh, looking at at uh, the rights of the common people, uh, um, they have problems with this uh, rising of, of, uh, of China, Saudi Arabia, and others. Uh, there is a question in the chat yeah. box. <laughs> yeah, so as long as there's to be the highest power in the hand. Um, yeah, well, that, that, uh, um, the competition is, is uh, um, um, I guess, China in, 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 in those years, that was, uh, was also the year before Xi Jinping uh, uh, took over, um, that China was, was uh, um, denied the uh, accession. Uh, um, and, and China then thought it was just a, a, a way of fairness to be, uh, uh, not to be pushed back, but to, uh, to be accepted as a rising uh, economic power and uh, that they should get the fair share of uh, say within the bank. Um, but uh, um, yeah, I guess m many powerful people in, in, uh, uh, in the US Congress just thought that China was just uh, the, the work bank, uh, the, the, uh, the sweatshop of the world and, and uh, they, uh, um, they were denying them these uh, this ascension, and uh, um, many political uh, um, conflicts between countries uh, arise from uh, uh, yeah from from this uh, lack of being treated fairly, uh, and uh, the same is true with the uh, with the NATO and and uh, so. Uh, the, the Western military bloc and Russia. They could tell you a lot about this. Why I think that uh, uh, Russia, of course, is 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 not not a, a nice guy, but uh, that that they definitely feel threatened. Um, and uh, um, yeah, um, it it has to do with with uh, uh, fairness among uh, uh, the powers that uh, um, they considered that. Uh, um, they they could rise and but um, the US now is thinking uh, about a competition who is first who is the biggest military power who is the biggest economic power and it's a struggle between those two and uh, um, other countries are um, either taking sides or uh, uh, trying to uh, to have a balanced approach to to both uh, uh, countries and uh, under the 
under the current uh, um, circumstances, when you see what's happening in the South Chinese Sea and so, it's not uh, a very promising uh, development. Mm, yeah, thank you very much, no, That's I have a you know question which is not related direct to this you know topic of today. Uh, but uh, do you think that uh, Xi Jinping is going to going too fast or faster than Deng Xiaoping in in global market? Should, what do you think? You you should ask Nora. I'm definitely <laughs> no China expert. Yeah. Uh, okay. Get get uh, get Nora to answer those questions. I uh, I'm, okay. I'm yeah. Uh, answer from Nora will be too academic <laughs> <laughs> but yeah. i want to get a little bit uh, you know uh, yeah. yeah well uh, I, uh, yeah i i can just say that i feel uh, um it it's not very promising that uh, xi jinping now is uh, uh, heading for a third term why uh, um, and and that that on the one hand i think it's good that uh, china is looking now is going back to look at, at the wealth distribution, um, but their methods, uh, that's what where I'm struggling with, you know? Yeah. Uh, um, yeah, that style, the, the, approach, the process of getting in. Yeah. So do you have any more question from, from fellows? If not, then we can pay our thanks to Knut for coming here and for being with us for one hour today. And I think uh, you get some points which you can you know, learn a little bit more from websites or other books. Uh, and uh, I think it will help you a lot to, to understand the World Bank and the system of multilateral development banks. Uh, like EIB, European Investment Bank, uh, or EBRD, or uh, ADB and AIB. I, uh, I, can, I can promise you that uh, Ryan Hassan, the Executive Director of NGO Forum and ADB, and Campaign Manager of Recourse, Petra Shell, will be here in next week to, to tell you more about ADB and AIIB, uh, what are the institutions, those institutions. Yeah. Uh, thank yeah, you, Knud. Very, yeah, please. Very esteemed colleagues. Yeah, I. Very good. Yeah. Oh, by the way, uh, in in an hour, I will have a, a dialogue with uh, uh, the German representative of the World Bank. So now, just now. Yeah. Yeah. Just oh. Now, just yeah. So so by fourteen, maybe we'll we'll come up with a small presentation on World Bank investment in Bangladesh especially in the fossil fuel sector. Thank you. Bye-bye for today.